Right, thanks. So uh, for last several lectures, I talked about uh, one algebra geometric model of link homology using braid varieties and related varieties and some structures that we can understand on that side. So today I will give completely different algebraic model uh, for link homology for some class of links. Uh, and this class of links is called algebraic links. So we start from a plane curve, f of xy is equal to zero in C2. Uh, and we assume that it has singularity at the origin. And for now, at least, I would assume that the curve is reduced. Uh, so this equation is reduced, but not necessarily reducible. So you can have several components. And to this thing, you can associate the link. So what happens, so you take a small sphere with the center at the origin, like this blue circle here. So C2 is four dimensional, the sphere will be three dimensional and you intersect it with the curve C. This will be a link in three dimensional sphere. And uh, if uh, the sphere is sufficiently small, it doesn't matter what's the radius, topological type is all the same. And so for example, if you have just a line, maybe I should start with a line actually, uh, like this horizontal line here, this would give you a circle in a sphere. If you have a default, if you have a node, x, y is equal to zero, uh, then I would have two circles in three dimensional sphere. Uh, and in fact, these two circles will be linked. That's not completely obvious, but that can be proved. And so we get this hop link, which we see over and over, uh, where we just have two crossings on two strands and take the closure of this link. Uh, but one way to see why you get them linked, because the linking number between these two components, so how they're actually linked, is equal to the intersection number, algebraic intersection number between these two curves at the origin. So these two lines intersect with multiplicity one. And so you expect the linking number one, and that's what we see here. Another example uh, is when we have a curve x squared is equal to y cubed. So that's a cusp. Uh, and this corresponds to the tree foil uh, t to three. So this is the closure of this braid. And in general, it's not so hard to see that if you have x to the m is equal to y to the n, this would be a torus link tmn. So this curve has as many components as GCD uh, of M and N. Uh, like here, uh, you have two components, here you have one component, and in general you have GCD of M and N components, and this corresponds to a link with uh, GCD of M and N components. And there are lots of uh, useful facts about these links. So first of all, irreducible components of a curve. So if you factor this polynomial f of x, y locally in the neighborhood uh, of the origin, irreducible component, locally irreducible components of C correspond to connected components of the link L. So in particular, if C is reduced and irreducible, uh, we get a knot with one component. And in this case, it was actually classically known how to classify such nodes. So not every node appears as an algebraic node. Uh, in fact, any algebraic node is an iterated cable of a torus node. So what happens is that you have this torus node, TMN, then you take a small neighborhood of this. Uh, it's a torus knotted in a complicated way in S3. And then you draw another torus node on the surface of that torus and you keep repeating this procedure. Uh, and so there are some conditions on the parameters of these torus nodes, which are written out in the literature, and there is actually full classification. So if you know what's Puiseux expansion of an irreducible plane curve singularity, from Puiseux exponents, you can just read off all these parameters of torus links. And how many Puiseux pairs? So the number of Puiseux pairs tells us the number of uh, cables that we need to do. Uh, and for general links, it's kind of more complicated. Uh, so each component of this link will be just uh, an algebraic knot, which we just described. But the way they're linked is kind of tricky. Uh, and it can be read of the resolution of singularities of C. It can be read of some other things. 
Uh, and there is a nice book of Eisenbach and Neumann on algebraic links and uh, uh, plum tree manifolds where they describe it in detail, how to describe such links, how to classify them and so on. So if you're interested, algebraic links are classified quite well for a while. In any case, we have an interesting class of links, which is very closely tied with algebraic geometry by definition, because it comes from an algebraic curve. And so the natural question is then to ask, if I know the algebraic geometry of the curve, uh, can I reconstruct some invariance of the link? And to various extents, it was answered by many people. And so what we're focused today is the following conjecture uh, of Oblong of Rasmussen and Schende from around 10 years ago. And it says that you take this curve C, you take the Hebrew scheme of K points on this curve C. So maybe I should write down. on C supported in the origin. Uh, and then you take just this disjoint union over all possible case and you have homology of the space. And then the claim, uh, which they say is that this homology is actually the same as again, degree zero part of um, triple grade homology of the link. And so in particular, if I know all these Hebrew schemes, I can uh, recover this triply graded homology, at least it's bottom A degree piece. And they give a recipe of how to deal with other pieces, but I won't talk about this. Uh, and of course, this has two gradings because we have the number of points K and we have homological degree, and this gives two gradings on the space. It's always infinite dimensional because there are infinitely many Hubert schemes, but uh, this is all also infinite dimensional up to some other things which we'll talk about. Uh, and then uh, the claim is that these are isomorphic, at least as vector spaces or bi-graded vector spaces. And you can ask about more structures later and that we'll talk about. And uh, this conjecture is still wide open so I'll review what is known and what is not known, uh, but it's quite remarkable from algebraic geometry point of view. So if you don't care about link homology again, this, you can read it in two different ways. So uh, originally, I think their idea was to say that this is a way to compute link homology. So at the time, nobody knew how to compute this link homology. Uh, and they say, well, so here's the explicit algebra geometric space, algebraic variety. So just uh, compute this homology of this variety and this gives you the answer. And in many cases, as we'll see today, we can actually effectively compute the homology of this space by using affine pavings and different things and other tools in algebraic geometry. And so we know the answer for link homology. And so in fact, this uh, computations for torus knows they were definitely inspired by this conjecture. On the other hand, uh, given all the progress in our understanding of link homology, you can reverse the logic and say, well, uh, so suppose that we know link homology, then we know actually homology of the Hebrew schemes, which is still very, very non-trivial. And I think uh, one of the basic uh, tests, uh, which is still not proved in any reasonable form, is that the left-hand side only depends on the link. So you can have different curves with different equations uh, which give the same links. So you can actually slightly deform the curve uh, within what is called the equisingularity class. The curve changes and the ring of functions on the curve changes and the Huber scheme of points on the curve changes. The link of course doesn't change. And so you have to explain that why this uh, homology of the Huber scheme doesn't change in this equisingular families. And as far as I know, this is a wide open question. Even except for torus links again. So, And there are other questions that you can kind of import from either side. So in particular, we talked about different structures on link homology, uh, like action of polynomial ring, action of these tautological classes. 
and you can ask what they're here and they give a lot of insight on this side as well which wasn't kind of expected from the beginning so there is a very even though the conjecture is still open in most cases there is a lot of interest in interaction and you can get some intuition from lean homology from known computations to get some intuition here or you can get some intuition from here and some constructions so, which I will review uh, to get some structural results about lean homology on the left hand side or at least conjecture them. Okay, so any, uh, maybe let me pause here and ask for uh, questions. So any questions, how do we build the link from the curve and what does the conjecture say? So this Hilbert scheme is singular. Yes. And so is there any anything about the intersection homology? Uh, not as I know of. You can ask uh, what is the intersection homology uh, and how to think about it. I don't know. I'll give you some examples where this thing was. But I don't know what to say. Any other question? Okay. So anyway, so here's one example, which is very, very concrete. So we we'll look at the node example. Uh, the curve is x, y is equal to zero. And again, we're looking not at the Huber scheme of points on the whole curve, just the one, the point supported the origin because that's the easiest one. So Hilbert scheme of zero points on a curve supported the origin in just one point. So you have one point is there. So this is just the ring of functions. This is ideal uh, all. Could I mention zero? Hilbert scheme of one point is again one point. It's the maximal ideal of that point at the origin. Hilbert scheme of two points on this curve because like you can prove it in different ways, but for example, this curve has uh, multiplicity two at the origin. So the Hilbert scheme of two points uh, on the curve is actually the Hilbert scheme of po two points on the whole C2 at the origin. And many of you know that this is just CP1. So Hilbert scheme of two points on the curve is P1. And then there is a computation, which I will skip for the interest of time, but there are some uh, problems in the exercise sheet if you want to do it. Uh, that Hilbert scheme of three points on this curve is actually a pair of lines glued at a point. So we have two CP1s uh, glued at one point, and this one point is actually, uh, so intersection point is the ideal generated by x square, x, y, and y square. This obviously has code dimension three. It contains x, y, so this is really an ideal on the curve. Uh, and uh, this is the singular point in this case. And then you have two lines out of the singular point. And then uh, Hilbert scheme of, huh? Question? Okay. Uh, so Hilbert scheme of four points uh, is the union of three lines. So the dimension won't grow up. It will be two lines. Here we'll have three lines uh, glued at two points. So these two points also correspond to monomial ideals. Uh, and in general, Hilbert scheme of k points on C0 will be a chain of k minus one lines glued in this uh, way. Uh, so you have just a chain of them. Uh, and so it's really easy to test this conjecture uh, in this case. So we can compute the homology of this Hilbert scheme explicitly. It is connected, so H0 is C, and you have uh, k minus one components. So you will have H2, which is C to the K minus one. And that's all in this case. And I guess you can also try to compute intersection homology, but yeah. Uh, and so in this case, uh, I mean, that's the answer. You just direct sum over OK. If you want to do Poincaré polynomial, which many people like, uh, so what do you have? So for zero point, you get one. For one point, you get, uh, one. So this is, what is this? This is sum of Q to the I, uh, T to the J dimension of H J of Hilde I. 
So Q degree tracks the number of points, T degree tracks uh, the homological degree. Uh, and so if you have zero points, that's one, uh, one point, it's one, two points, it's one plus T squared, that's homology of P1. Uh, three points, it's one plus two D squared. So H0 is one and H2 is two dimensional and so on. So you add it up, it's a rational function and you get one over one minus Q. So for this one plus Q plus Q squared plus Q cube and so on. And Q squared T squared divided by one minus Q squared. And so this is the answer and you can compare it with the answer for the Hopling that we had before. So if you remember anything from first lecture, from second lecture, the homology was R plus R mod X one minus X two, where R was the polynomial ring in two variables. And so the polynomial ring in two variables correspond to this term uh, and the polynomial ring in one variable, which you get by quotient by x1 minus x2, uh, is this one over one minus q. And so these guys are separating kind of in homological degree in link homology, and this shift is given by this q squared t squared. So there is some change of variables, but up to this regrading, the answers are indeed the same, at least on the level of uh, graded vector spaces. And I think that's a very nice example because you see kind of more and more and more complicated spaces, but there is still a lot of structure here. So it's not random. Like there is a lot of, I mean, the fact that this uh, generating function is rational is not a coincidence by any means. Okay. All right. Any questions? Okay, so uh, as I said, this conjecture is wide open in general. So besides uh, some cases, it's not known. It's known on the level of Euler characteristics. So there is a monumental work of Davish Monik uh, who proved that if you take the Euler characteristic of the Hebrew scheme of K points, then you recover the home fly polynomial. So that was a separate conjecture uh, of a Blanc of Enchenda about this uh, Euler characteristic. Uh, and you home fly polynomial depends on two parameters Q and A. You said A is equal to zero as you would do in the homology. And so Davis used a lot of machinery to prove this result. So he related this Euler characteristic to the topic of this conference to counting curves and counting stable pairs supported by this curve uh, and various relations um, between PT and DT invariants and blow up formula. So there was a lot of technology directly related to the topic of this conference, which unfortunately I will not review. Uh, but let me just say, so this is related to stable pairs. So basically you relate the ideals on the curve to stable pairs supported on the curve. Uh, and so you have PT, DT invariance, uh, and the blow up formula for this. And so there is a lot of technology related to kind of counting ideals uh, on the plane or uh, on three dimensional, threefold uh, related to this thing, uh, and uh, counting ideals supported on this single curve. And that's very powerful proof, which is indication that something is definitely going on. And then a uh, much more kind of low tech thing is that we know the answer for torus nodes. So for torus nodes, and I don't think we know the full answer for torus links yet, uh, as far as I know, uh, but for torus nodes at least with one component, you can compute both sides. So again, HHH was computed by recursions from lecture one, which I kind of sketched and didn't really explain, but the work of Hogan, Kapp, and Mellet in particular, they give very, very explicit recursion uh, and very, very explicit combinatorial formulas for uh, these uh, dimensions of different graded pieces. And on the other hand, Hebert's scheme of points on the uh, Torus nodes, so torus nodes corresponds to a curve x to the m is equal to y to the n. 
this is the curve with the resection. And so as such, it has a paving by fine cells, which can be constructed very, very explicitly and combinatorially. And you can enumerate all the cells. And I will review this enumeration in slightly different setup. And there is a combinatorial formula for dimensions. So I think in this setting, this was explicitly written in this paper of Oblong with Rasmussen and Schender. And so they say like, what are combinatorial data enumerated in the cells? What is the dimension of a given cell with this combinatorial data for every key? And so there are finite many cells for every given key. You can enumerate them uh, and you can compute the Poincaré polynomial then. So this comparison between these two combinatorial answers solves the problem for um, torus nodes just because we can compute both sides. And again, like the methods of computation are very different and it would be very exciting uh, to explicitly compare recursions here and recursions here. And uh, that's not fully done. Like to find the geometric analog of these recursions on the left and like what they actually mean, what does KN mean, for example, which appeared in the recursion. And in any case, so like maybe the main outcome of these computations of Hogan and Mellot, we can now verify this conjecture. And then besides like actual computations and actual proofs, you can ask for various structural results. Like if the interesting structures on either side, do they match something on the other side? Uh, and for example, recall that if you have an R component link, then last time I think I explained that uh, triplet grade homology has an action of polynomial algebra C of x1 through xr. So for each uh, component of a link, you can put a marked point, and that gives you a polynomial action, and that is a nice invariant of your link. And so it is important because, like, usually we're dealing with huge infinite dimensional spaces. So for example, here. Uh, you had two component link and you have this explicit structure of a module over two variables, x1 and x2. And you can ask, well, so on the left hand side, do you have the structure of this module? And the answer is yes. And so for one component, there is an action of polynomial algebra in one variable, uh, and actually of the Heisenberg algebra, uh, constructed by Malik Yun, Milirini Shende, and random also random explicitly constructed the Heisenberg uh, or while algebra of one generator. Uh, so he constructed this kind of the action of X and D over DX in some sense. And the commutator was one. Uh, and so he constructed the action of both X and D over DX. And then for more components, this was done by Oscar Kivinen. Uh, so for roughly speaking, for each component of a curve, you can add a point. And so if your link has R components, this means that your algebra curve has I R components. And very roughly X I adds the points on this ith component. But uh, you need to be very, very careful if you want to say this properly. So all these moduli spaces are singular. So you can't just uh, naively use correspondences to define operators in homology. Uh, so the way that it was done in I think all these papers really uh, is that you have to use a versal deformation of the curve, look at the versal family and the family of Hubert schemes associated to the versal family uh, and define some correspondences there and use the fact that the family, the versal family is actually smooth. So the key fact uh, observed by many people here mm -hmm. Wait, you have C tilde is a versal family. Then here is scheme of C tilde is most. So you do it fiber wise for each curve in this family. And then the total space is smooth and then you can do some operations there. So, and then you can add a point for each component, one component at a time. 
And you have some analog of this DOR DX as well, which was also constructed by Oscar. Uh, and another thing which is useful, which I want to really talk about, is that you can also look at kind of global curves. So here I have Hebrew scheme at the origin. Uh, for some of these uh, actions, it's much better to look at the whole curve C or compactification of C in CP2. But I won't talk about this. And another thing is that you can do get a lot more structure if you add break the symmetry. So recall that our uh, construction of link homology uses the braid. So it doesn't start from a link itself. And here, somehow one issue why this conjecture is complicated uh, is that you don't get a link as a diagram. You don't get a link as a product of crossings. You get a link as like the whole uh, subset of S3 given by intersection with this curve. And it's not clear where are the crossings, where is the braid, uh, where is anything resembling the things that we saw before. And one step in that direction is to choose a projection of my curve to some line. So this is related to what uh, Richard mentioned yesterday, uh, that you can th think of this C as a spectral curve. So you choose this uh, line. Again, everything is affine. So this is just a straight line with coordinate x. And we project our curve onto this line. And th there is some degree of this projection, which is n. And so if I take push forward of the structure shift of c, I get a rank n free module over the ring of functions on the line. And again, I completed the origin. And on this ring of functions, I have an action of y. So the other coordinate, the vertical coordinate, uh, which acts by uh, multiplication by y. So we'll see some example in a second. And so this is more structure. And as we will see, this more structure gives us uh, more control of the situation. And maybe I think I didn't write it here, but I can say this. Now, so the choice of projection, uh, what does it mean in terms of the link? So note the choice of projection. For C corresponds to the presentation. of my link as a braid closure. And so this is the picture that I think many of you have seen, uh, that you look at the small circle on the base of this projection, and you look at the pre-image. So the pre-image of this point will be end points on the curve C. And as this point on the base goes around, you have some monodromy. Uh, and so this picture gives you what is called the braid monodromy. Because for every point, I have n point. For every point on the base, I have n points on the curve. Uh, and then if I start moving this point on the base, this n points uh, start twisting around and get linked to each other and they behave like a braid or braid closure. And kind of more abstractly, you can think that the fiber is one dimensional complex line. So this is a real two dimensional uh, plane. And then you have endpoints on this real two dimensional plane. And then as we go around, we have a loop in the configuration space of endpoints uh, on two dimensional plane, that's a closed braid. And so, Naturally, we can associate uh, a braid or braid closure or a conjugacy class of a braid to the choice of this projection. And again, for different choices, we'll have slightly different braids on different number of strands because the degree of the projection could be different. But this is additional structure, which helps a lot to kind of understand better what's going on. And so here is a concrete example. Uh, so if I uh, start from a curve from the cusp x squared is equal to y cubed, 
So we can write the ring of functions on the curve as well. Polynomials are a series in X and Y mod this equation, but you can also choose a basis in the ring of functions. Namely, you have all possible functions in X and uh, spanned by one Y square and one Y and Y squared. And so if I have Y cubed, you can express it as X squared. So you don't really need Y cubed, but you can always uh, write it in this form. That the ring of function is actually a free module over C of X of rank three. Uh, and this is the basis of this free module. And moreover, we can describe the action of multiplication by y in this basis. So one goes to y, y goes to y square, and y square goes to y cube, which is x square. So the matrix of multiplication by y is this thing on the right. So one goes to y, y goes to y square, and y square goes to x square. So in this case, the degree of the projection is three, here for I have three module of rank three uh, and I have this three by three matrix and on the biological side, this corresponds to choosing this as a closure of three strand braid. So here, this would correspond to a three strand braid, which you can actually write down. I mean, it will be this one. And then equals. Uh, and if instead you project to the y coordinate, then you can also regard this as a free module over uh, y. So this c of y uh, with the basis given by one and x. And again, x square you can now eliminate and replace by y cube. And then my capital X is the matrix. Uh, uh, of multiplication by x. And so the here uh, one goes to x, but x goes to y cubed under multiplication by x. And so this corresponds to the two strand braid, uh, which looks like this. And there are, of course, different descriptions of the same curve. So topologically, you can say you can get the same link by closures of different braids and different number of strands. And algebraically, you can just project to different lines. And as uh, Richard explained yesterday, uh, knowing this data actually is enough to recover the curve. So if I know this free module uh, of rank three, for example, with this operator y, depending on x square, I can recover the curve easily. Uh, and namely, the equation of the curve is just characteristic polynomial of this matrix. So you have this matrix depending on x. If I take characteristic polynomial, I get the equation y cubed minus x squared. And then the roots of this characteristic polynomial are precisely the, uh, the locus of the roots is precisely the spectral curve C. And I think in this case, we, should, if we assume that our uh, curve is reduced. Uh, then the characteristic polynomial is the same as minimal polynomial. And so we don't have some of the issues that uh, Richard mentioned last time. And so again, just to sum up, uh, so this is completely formal procedure uh, that we can replace a curve just as a curve on the plane. By choice of this projection, we replace it by the following data. So we have a free module over uh, let's say power series in one variable together with an operator which depends on this uh, variable x. Uh, so any questions about this construction, any questions about this kind of relation to braids and stuff? Okay, so if that is clear, uh, then we can uh, define what is called the fine spring of fiber of C. So this would depend not only of C, but also of this choice of projection. And so we'll look at all possible subsets, subspaces in Laurent series in X. So here I have power series in X. Now I want to do Laurent series in X. And I want V to be a lattice. So I want this to be a module of maximal rank, which is a technical condition. And more importantly, I want this V to be invariant under multiplication by X. So this is, 
And I want this to be invariant under multiplication by under the action of this operator Y. Uh, and so this is a subset uh, in a fine Grassmannian. And you can think of this a fine Grassmannian, which uh, Joel already introduced last time. This is just the, the set of the same Vs in Cn of X, uh, where just X V subset of V. And again, you have this latest condition. So if you like a fine Grassmannian, you can think that uh, you have this uh, space of all Vs invariant under X, and then you put additional constraint that this V is invariant under this matrix. And that is why it's called the fine Springer fiber in some sense. And so this is this subset of a fine Grassmannian. And so what do we know about this subset? So, well, if C is irreducible and reduced, uh, then this uh, a fine Springer fiber is the same as what is called compactified Jacobian of C. Do you have an echo? Uh, so, yeah, maybe it's compactified the car. Uh, I mean, locally, everything is local, so I guess it doesn't matter that much. And up to some shift on the latest, which I ignore. Uh, and this compact, this is very close, let's say, to compactified Jacobian of C, and which is defined as this moduli space of rank one torsion free shifts on C with some framing because we work locally. And a remarkable result, uh, which uh, uh, was known for a while, is that this is actually the same as the Hubert scheme of a large number of points uh, on a curve. So if your uh, curve is irreducible, and this is really, really important assumption here, so and reduced. Uh, then the Hubert scheme of points actually stabilize for a sufficiently large n, and this is a fine Springer fiber is uh, this stable Hubert scheme, and it's the same as compact spectacle. And so you might have seen this uh, in different uh, settings. And in particular, so this kind of looks different, but in fact, it is the same thing as what we studied for the Hubert scheme. And even more is true, so Megalini and Shende and Molly can you prove that in fact this uh, homology of Hubert scheme of points on the curve, which we were the subject of that conjecture, uh, is completely packed in the homology of the affine Springer fiber. So you have your curve, you choose a projection in some way, uh, and then you have your uh, you take the homology of that. That carries so-called perverse filtration which I will not define, but it's an interesting filtration in homology. Uh, and the claim is that if you have this uh, homology of a fine Springer fiber equipped with perverse filtration, uh, then tensor with polynomial ring in one variable, and you recover the left-hand side, the homology of the Hebrew scheme of points on uh, C0. And maybe I want to mention here that, for example, by this work of Renemo, so the left hand side has an action of this uh, Heisenberg algebra in one variable with x and d over dx. And so this is the same x. This is the same polynomial action on the left. And because there is an action of d over dx, it's actually a free module. So we just kill this free action. And what's left is this. So this is very, very natural thing. And in fact, yeah. You can define, like if you know the action of this polynomial ring on the left, you can use this to define perverse filtration in essentially unique way uh, using this formula and using the work of Renamo. But it, they did it slightly differently using again, versal deformation and decomposition theorem and other things which I don't have time to talk, to, talk about. And uh, uh, moreover, Molyuk and Yun, they proved that there is an action of SL2 on the right hand side, on this finite dimensional thing. Yeah, so Oscar is commenting that uh, if R is bigger than one, you have to replace SP gamma by SP gamma quotient by some lattice, which I will describe in a second uh, what is the lattice. Uh, and maybe we'll come back to this comment. <laughs> 
Uh, but uh, like in the reducible case, uh, for one component, so they proved that there is an action of SL2 on this homology. And this is kind of less known about that paper, but I think it's a beautiful result that you always have an action of SL2 here generated by cup product with some class in H upper two. So raising operated at the cup product on SL, uh, with a class in H two. And then they proved that this also satisfies curious hard lapses. So if you remember anything from uh, last uh, lecture, there was an action of SL2 in link homology, which satisfied some kind of curious hard lapses property. And here again, you have this, but this curious hard lapses is with respect to perverse filtration. So again, this, this is a singular space in general, and we'll see example where it is really, really singular. And on the singular space, you wouldn't expect the normal hard Lapschitz and Poincaré duality because it's just not true. You don't have it. But if you take associated graded with respect to perverse filtration and shift the degrees a little bit, then it becomes symmetric. Uh, and then it actually satisfies this hard Lapschitz and everything if you do it properly with respect to perverse filtration. So this is really, I think, remarkable results. So, Mm, I think, yeah, this is just proved in this paper of Malik Bindu, but this is a very, very nice paper. And uh, this, as I said, compare this with curious hard lapses for weight filtration uh, on uh, braid varieties from lecture three. Okay, so maybe a couple of examples. Uh, okay. Let's start with this example. So if I have the node again, so I want to write the node as x squared is equal to y squared because I want to choose a nice projection and I can choose the matrix in different ways. Let me choose the matrix like this. You can also choose the matrix uh, as x zero zero minus x and that will be useful for us in a sec. Uh, and then the corresponding of Einspringer fiber is actually bad. So None of these theorems apply. This is not an irreducible curve, x squared is equal to y squared. And a fine spring of fiber is actually an infinite chain of P1s. So you need additional structure here to control its homology. But this is probably the most well-known example. Uh, another well-known example is that you have a cusp. So the spring of fiber for, a fine spring of fiber for that thing is P1. And this is the same as compact by Jacobian for the cusp. So I think I don't have time to explain this. In this case, it's nice and smooth and the perverse filtration is trivial. So there is nothing there. And what is known in general is that if you have X to the M is equal to Y to the N, again, this corresponds to a torus knot, GCD of MN is equal to one. And then lots and lots of people study this space many more than Hebert scheme on this curve. But again, essentially this is equivalent. Uh, and many, many people proved uh, in different ways that this is paved by fine cells and you can parameterize this fine cells by lots of different combinatorial data. Uh, and you can compute dimensions of the cells. And this is beautifully related to the theory of Q to the Catalan numbers and combinatorics. So the references, I think the first is Lustig against mouth who first studied this affine spring of fiber, and then Piankowski, who studied this as compact by Jacobin, and then uh, Hikita, who studied this space and generalization to affine flats, and then our work with uh, Misha Meisel and Monica Vazirani, when we studied kind of more combinatorially and related this to Fidio Catalan. And so there is a lot of uh, work on this thing, which I won't be able to cover in detail, but one concrete example, uh, is that you have the curve x cube is equal to y to the fourth. So this is uh, this corresponding SPY or compact by Jacobian is this thing. So this is a cone over here to Brooks surface. And so this is singular. You have a singular point at the tip of the cone. And so how does this cell decomposition work? So here's the Brooks surface has one zero cell, uh, two complex one cells and one complex two cells. Then you take cones of this. So you will have two cell, four cell, 
two four cells and one six cell, and then you have the vertex which gives you the uh, zero cell. So this is really projective form. Uh, and so the homology looks like this: H zero is one dimensional, H two is one dimensional, H four is two dimensional, H six is uh, also one dimensional. And you can compute the perverse filtration. It's not so easy, but I mean, you can compute it using the Hilbert schemes and the theorem of uh, molecular given the dimension, though you can compute it by definition. Uh, and it turns out that H4 has two pieces in different levels of perverse filtration. So it looks like this. And again, there is a curious hard left uh, because you have in the class in H upper two, you can copy it. And then you have the top thing will be like, so this will be maybe alpha, and this will be maybe alpha square, and this will be maybe alpha cube. And there is another generator beta over here uh, of different perverse degree. And this should be compared with E6 picture. So the picture of E6 plus the variety from last time, where I had exactly the same thing uh, for weight filtration in cohomology of the braid variety. And so this example and many other examples and also more general work of uh, the Cataldo House on Millerini uh, led the action to conjecture that this is actually always true. So he conjectured this also about 10 years ago that homology braid variety or some analog of braid variety uh, together with the weight filtration is actually isomorphic to uh, homology of this fine Springer fiber or compact Jacobian together with perverse filtration, at least in this uh, irreducible case. So in non-irreducible case, it's much worse. And uh, as far as I know, this conjecture is really wide open, even in this case, I mean, you can, whenever you can compute both sides, it's true. And so I guess that's all what we know. And I mean, there are some deep ideas why this might be true, non-abelian Hodge correspondence and things like this, but maybe I don't have time to talk about this. But maybe what I want to say is that the left-hand side is an open but smooth variety. So this is non-compact but smooth. And this thing is compact, but very, very singular. And so there are just two different settings and it turns out that they have the same homology. So this is non-compact and always smooth, at least like in all examples we need. And this is uh, compact and singular. And again, you can probably ask about uh, intersection homology here, but I don't know what would be the right question. Okay, and another thing which I want to mention, since I mentioned tautological classes last time, is that we constructed, or I kind of indicated how to construct ophthalmological classes on the left, uh, and what are the weights and stuff. And on the right hand side, at least for this particular singularity, x of m is wider than uh, Ablonkov and Yun constructed an action of ophthalmological classes on this side. So they really come from some vector bundle on uh, sp gamma, and they proved, so this is a big result of Ablonkov and Yun that the, this homology is generated by tautological classes like it is here. So there are two tautological classes, alpha and beta, and then they wrote all relations between these classes pretty explicitly. So uh, in, and again, like if we believe in this conjecture, you can ask, is it true on the left? So we have tautological classes now, can we write the relations between them? Can we verify them on the left-hand side? even though we don't know uh, if the conjecture is true. But like, for example, is it true that homologies are isomorphic, not only as graded vector spaces, but as rings? And that's a very good question, which uh, one should look at. Okay. And so in the slightly different direction, uh, I want to mention a result of Oscar Kivinen uh, so what happens if you have a lot of components? So if you have a lot of components, like in the extreme case, you can have x to the kn is equal to y to the n. So here we'll have, so this corresponds to t 
n k n. So here we'd have n component. Uh, and all components are not, all the inking numbers are k. And we saw this example last time, actually. So the corresponding n by n matrix has this form. So you have diagonal matrix with roots of unity, all different roots of unity of degree n on the diagonal times x to the k. And uh, for n is equal to two, this is uh, uh, this matrix x and minus x and zero, zero. In general, then we have all roots of unity. Uh, and so you can ask, what is the fine Springer fiber for this particular matrix? And this was studied by many people, starting from Goreski, Kletzvi, and McPherson, and others. And so in particular, you have an action of the lattice, which acts on this fine Springer fiber by translation. So n minus one dimensional lattice acts on it by translations. And you see it here, sorry for scrolling up and down, that you have an infinite chain of P1s, and it's big and kind of complicated, but you have an action of Z by translations, let's say one step at the right or uh, to the right or two steps to the right, depending on what you want to do. Uh, and you also have a, an action of the torus because the torus, C star to the N, commutes with this matrix wise, so it stabilizes this and it acts on the fine spring fiber. And so, you can, so what Oscar actually proved in this theorem is that uh, if you take just homology of SP gamma, it matches the link homology with all the structures. So we have the action of the lattice, it corresponds to the action of these polynomial variables up to some subtlety. And equivariant homology of this affine Springer fiber matches Y fide or deformed homology of the link. Uh, which uh, depend on additional variables y1 through yn and which are identified with equivariant parameters. And so I don't want to write these answers again, but you have explicit formulas for this. In lecture three. And I will return to this probably next time, but again, I don't have time for it today, but there are some explicit ideals uh, in the polynomial ring uh, involved. And so uh, basically he compared this homology and with all the structures to these ideals in the polynomial. And this shows that not only we can identify this homology as a vector space with link homology, according to uh, oblong of Rasmus and Shandy conjectures, but also we have this additional structure of acting of x's and y's, and we can perfectly see it in this setting. So, and in this setting, it's actually easier to work with a fine Springer fiber because you really see this lattice action and you really see the torus action. And for the Hubert scheme on a curve, you don't really see that, unfortunately. Uh, so you can ask what is the meaning of that, but that's a separate story. Okay, and so maybe the last thing which I want to uh, mention today is a very recent work of Gardner and Kivinen, which I think is very nice. Uh, and I want to advertise as much as possible. So now you can take any curve C and it could be irreducible, it could be reducible, it could be even non-reduced. So for this, it doesn't matter. It's so general and so uh, nice that you can have any equation of a curve uh, not necessarily reduced. And then what they proved is that the Hubert scheme of points on the curve is not an affine Springer fiber uh, for uh, GLM, but it is actually generalized affine Springer fiber. So there is a notion of generalized affine Springer fiber depending on uh, the group GLM and a representation N, uh, which is in this case, uh, the Lie algebra of GLN and together with the vector representation CN. And so this generalized affine spring of fiber, it depends on the vector in N of uh, X. Depends on a vector. Yeah. 
And we choose this vector. So this is the matrix, n by n matrix, and the vector in CN. So we just choose it to be this y and then uh, a vector, let's say, 1, 0, 0, 0 in appropriate basis. And uh, you can see properly what it is. And one consequence of this is that there is an action of a very interesting algebra again. We're up to interesting structures in cohomology. And so Braverman, Finkelberg, and Nakajima, for any G and any N, they define a certain algebra, which is called the BFN Coulomb branch algebra, which uh, Joel uh, started defining yesterday uh, and will, I guess, define fully today. So this is really from Joel's talk. This is the same algebra. Joel's lectures. And uh, one result is under some mild assumptions, this algebra for G, G and N acts on the homology of a fine spring of fiber uh, for G and N, for any choice of vector, really, uh, under some really, really mild assumptions. And so in particular, there is an action of uh, this big interesting algebra in cohomology of Hilbert scheme of K points uh, on a curve, direct sum over all K. And uh, this unifies like all the construction that I mentioned before. Furthermore, if a curve is quasi homogeneous, if it admits a cis direction, like our friend x to the m is equal to y to the n, uh, then there is a cis direction on the curve, there is a cis direction on the Hilbert scheme. And you can look at equivariant cohomology of the Hilbert scheme. Uh, and there is an action of some other algebra on cohomology of the Hilbert scheme, which is known as quantized BFN algebra, which I'm sure Joel will define today. And this is a non commutative algebra, uh, which acts in this equivariant cohomology. And so it helps a lot to compute this cohomology and gives like very rigid structure to it because it's a module over some very explicit non commutative algebra. And in fact, uh, Kodera and Nakajima described this algebra for us. So they said that this, for this particular choice of G and N, where G is the, the group GLN and N is the joint representation, the Lie algebra of GLN plus CN, uh, this quantized BFN algebra is known as, is nothing but what is called as rational Chernik algebra or spherical, actually, rational Chernik algebra, if you want to be pedantic. And this is an algebra which people studied. Uh, and you can describe it very, very explicitly by generators and relations and so on. And so this result says that uh, there is an action of this algebra which people understand in the homology that we want to study, which is supposed to be link homology or equivariant version of link homology. And so this raises a lot of question. Is there an action of this rational Chernik algebra? in link homology or kind of deformation of it corresponding to this equivariant parameters. Is there, uh, can we identify this representation? And in many cases, the answer is yes. And they identify this representation. And what happens uh, for non-reduced curves? So here you can uh, start doing non-reduced curves. They still have this direction and you still have an action of some algebra. Uh, and there, is a, there are lots of interesting questions here. And maybe one specific example of non-reduced curve is x to the n is equal to zero uh, also works. So they, uh, I think this is the first example where uh, you can understand properly the homology of the Hilbert scheme on non-reduced curve. So you have ideals in the ring of polynomials in x and y mod x to the n, and you have some interesting structure there. You can compute the homology and the same techniques shows that you have an action of this quantized BFN algebra in this equivariant homology. Uh, and you can identify this representation very explicitly. And I think this is very nice and kind of brings all the structure together. And I would expect that uh, maybe other, especially non-reduced curves can be studied by this machinery. Even though you don't have a cell decomposition by geometric representation theory, gives you another way to study this spaces. And I think that's all for today.
Thank you very much. And again, Oscar is there uh, in the audience, so you can ask him after the talk for more clarifications. Any questions for Eugene, for Oscar? Is there, is there like a key theoretic version of this last thing? Yes. yes. So you, you would have a Daha, uh, some version of Daha, and I'm not sure like if it's worked out uh, in full detail. So if you would have GLN without C to the N, I think this is really just the Daha defined by Sheridnik. Uh, and this was worked out by Ettingov, Braverman, and Finkelberg, I guess. Uh, and if you have the CN, I'm not sure if the K-theoretic... So there, there is certainly a notion of K-theoretic BFN algebra. I'm just not sure if that was computed explicitly. Yeah, but it's tri trigonometric. trigonometric. It's trigonometric? Uh-huh. Uh okay, so then you have trigonometric Daha and then, but I think like all this would work in K-theoria because I think so. I mean, the, the construction is very general then by some correspondences, so that should work, I think. And would this be related to any like not invariance like on the other side? Or? Uh, I mean, the, this space, the homology of the Hubert scheme is supposed to be the same as the link homology, right? So you would have an action of this algebra in link homology. Here, you would have some kind of deformation of link homology with one extra parameter, which uh, might be related to this wi fi homology or not. That's, I'm not 100% sure here, uh, but you would have an interesting action of, uh, of this algebra there. And you can ask, well, so you have this, lots of interesting operators acting in link homology. Do they, are they related to tautological classes that we constructed last time? That's an awesome question. Do they give you extra structure in link homology? I don't know, but these are all uh, excellent questions. So, um, yeah, I, I wanted to ask yesterday when you discussed this, um, why deformed homology for things? Uh -huh. um, you had this operator psi. Yes. Uh, and do you see and some DG structures? So do you see them on the cohomology of Springer fiber side? Yes. Yeah, so these psi are Kazul dual to wise. And so mm -hmm. these are covariant parameters here. And you can also find kind of uh, because you have this direction, instead of looking at equivariant homology, you can look at non-equivariant homology with kind of the action of homology of C star. Uh, and then size are generated in homology of C star. But they're really Kazul dual to wise. So maybe I, I want to mention this. So uh -huh. Or Kazul dual to wise. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, this means that you have uh, kind of interesting degree one operators in here, uh, which you can study and they're not closed, but you can control them. And it, 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 but you can construct some closed operators as well. And maybe what's more relevant is that, I guess you can take the quotient uh, by the latest action, which you like and many people in the audience like, uh, and there still is an action of the torus. And I think there you can see this size more clearly, but I don't know if that is um, explicitly worked out. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. We also have a question in the Q&A. So is the affine Springer fiber related to the Sato Grassmannian and Katz Schwartz operators? I don't know. I just don't know. Uh, maybe I want to say, uh, so since Oscar mentioned this and I didn't say this, and I think it's related to Peng's question. So uh, you have this example. I can write it down here. So you have this example where x square is equal to y square. So we have an infinite chain of P1s. 
and you have an action of Z uh, by translations, and you have an action of uh, C star, which scales all these things. And you can take the quotient, so this is my SP. And if I take the quotient by Z, I will get just one line which glued to itself at a point. So this is a line glued to itself. And here you can see that you have H0, H1. Oops, one second. Uh, H0, H1, and H2, one second, sorry. Collapsed now. Can you see it? You can see your screen, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so this is the line glued to itself. And uh, here I have interesting H0, H1, and H2. And so there are several comments here. So one comment is that uh, this matches the computation uh, for this one plus x, y is not equal to zero, which we saw last time. And again, this is a very, very different space. So here I have a line glued to itself. There I have kind of an open subset of C2, but the homology is the same. So this is another argument towards uh, the X conjecture. And another thing is like how do you actually, and you still have an action of C star on this. And so you can either look at equivariant homology, which is fine, or you can compare it to link homology where we had this R, 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 that was zero and that was X1 minus X2. And then if I, if there is no C star action, so we kill X I and we get just three copies of uh, C, C, C. with zero differential, right? So if I kill X, I, and R, I get uh, just nothing. I get just C from each of them. So I can take the right answer product with C over R. And so my odd variables, Xi that uh, Peng asked about, they, they would act here. And so you would have an action here. And so I think you would have an action of uh, odd variable in this homology, which you see very clearly, uh, that you should have an action of basically homology of C star here, which would go, I think, from H0 to H1, but I might be wrong. I can't think of it in the, in the spot, but like this is certainly the same space in the same vector space that this three dimensional homology of this quotient by the lattice is this three dimensional homology, and there should be an interesting arrow corresponding to this psi. And there should be another interesting arrow corresponding to what I called U2 yesterday. Uh, and this U2 gives you a class in top dimension homology. So yeah, homological operations here would give you interesting operations uh, in this homology over here. And again, I mean, by essentially causal duality, if you know this, deformed homology as a module over uh, axis and y's, you know this undeformed homology as a module of size and axis, and uh, you have all the structures. And again, this lattice action and the torus action play the role of uh, uh, different variables and link homology that we saw. Yeah. And there is a subtlety between homology and Burrell Moore homology, which you can ask Oscar about. Yes. Okay. Uh, you have any other questions? All right, Eugene. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much.